So next, I'd like to talk about other methods for finding uh, option prices. Our purpose here is not to teach you the formula for all option prices. My purpose here is to show you in the simplest worked out example how one goes about doing option pricing formulas. So the method that we did uh, last time to figure out the option price is we found the differential equation for the discount factor, solved that forward, and then found price uh, from the solved forward differential equation for the discount factor. That's a method. It's a method that works in this case, but it's a method that requires you to solve some pretty hairy integrals. And you might imagine that in more complex models, solving those hairy integrals wouldn't be as easy as it was for us to do this time. Here's another method. And the idea is, is, is uh, very, it's, it's two sides of the same coin. Rather than solve the discount factor differential equation forward and then price things, why don't we solve the pricing differential equation forward uh, di directly? So find the instantaneous change in price and then solve that differential equation. It's the differential equation approach to option pricing. Better to do it than just to talk about it. How might we go about this problem another way? Let us guess that the call option price when we're all done will be a function of the stock price and time. Uh, An interest rate is a parameter, but the only way it varies over its life is as the stock price varies over its life and as time till expiration shrinks. If that's true, then let's apply Ito's lemma. We want to find what that function is once we've guessed that that's what the functional form looks like. Well, just use Ito's lemma. Let's take the total derivative. We've got the derivative with respect to time, the derivative with respect to the stock price, and the Ito term, one half second derivative with respect to stock price. We still have the stock price as a geometric diffusion, mu dt plus sigma dz. So let's write that as the ds term is s times mu. ds squared is s squared times sigma squared. So those are all the dt terms. And then from this term here, we have a cs times the diffusion term of the stock price. So uh, dc, if that's the functional form, then the change in, consumption, in uh, the call option price must look like that. Now, we're going to do our pricing instantaneously and then do a differential, solve the differential equation once we've found the price. Pricing instantaneously means let's take our friend lambda, let's take our discount factor, and impose that the call option is correctly priced by the discount factor given the stock and bond. That's, that's how we've done this. So we're going to create a discount factor that prices the stock and bond, use that to price the call option. That must mean use our regular equation for instantaneous pricing on the call option. What does that mean? Well, substitute in. E of dc over c, there's what dc looks like. So multiplying both sides of this equation by c, it's more convenient to do it that way. E of dc over c, what do we got? Well, that's E of dc is c sub t times delta t. There's my ct term. E of dc over c, there is the c s s mu. That, that whole term is the E of dc term, and that whole term shows up here. Minus r, and we multiply both sides by c, so I have a minus rc. Now, what's over on the right-hand side? Here's the interesting lambda stuff. dc over c, d lambda over lambda. There's the dc over c term. The dt terms go away. We multiply that by our friend the d lambda over lambda term. d lambda over lambda, the Ito term on that was mu minus r over sigma. Uh, and the minus sign there cancels the minus sign there. Now let's just collect some terms. And what do we got? We got the, the cs, uh, the sigmas cancel here, and the mu's cancel there. So what we're left over with is if the call option is correctly priced instantaneously, by our friend, the discount factor, which prices stocks and bonds, then the call option price function must satisfy this differential equation. We, let, let's, go, let's get away from the math and think of what we've done. We've imposed pricing instantaneously by our friend, the discount factor, the price of stock and bond, and we've discovered a differential equation that the price must follow if, it's, if, if that pricing is correctly done. We've derived the Black-Scholes differential equation. Any asset whose price is some function of stock and uh, time 
given the geometric Brownian motions for stock and the constant interest rate, must satisfy that differential equation. So now all we got to do uh, is solve that. That's, that's kind of attractive. That's just an, that's a, it's a partial differential equation, but there's no stochastic stuff in it left anymore. We just have to solve that differential equation. We have a boundary condition. We know what the call option price has to be at expiration. It has to be our friend the hockey stick. So what do we do? Look, we've got a derivative with respect to time, and we've got derivatives with respect to stock price. So that just lets us march back from expiration and find out what the call option will be at any time prior to expiration. Specifically, you know, if you're given the call option price at any time, you can find the call option price at any time previous to that time just by subtracting off how much the call option price is supposed to change with time. What's that? We'll simply solve this equation for CT, and it tells you, given the spatial derivatives at time t, what should the time derivative be? So given how much the call option price is varying with stock price, first and second derivatives, you can say how much it should vary through time. Then you know how to bring it back through time. Just start at expiration, evaluate these derivatives, march it back through time, and you've got the call option price at any date. Now, seriously, how does one solve partial differential equations without going nuts? The, the main technique is known as guess and check. <laughs> so I could, uh, if I wanted to put you all to sleep, what I could do is plug in the Black-Scholes formula, calculate these derivatives, and verify that it satisfies that uh, differential equation. That's how you solve partial differential equations. Another way of solving a partial differential equation is a clever, there's a clever transformation to an integral representation. And that transformation leads to exactly the integral that we've already solved. We got to that uh, by direct methods. A third way of solving uh, partial differential equations is numerically. Just following basically the suggestion I gave here. Start at expiration where you know what it is, calculate the spatial derivatives, move back in time. Uh, all of those are, 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 are equivalent ways of getting to the same answer. This is a technique that's particularly useful when you have a problem that's hard. Uh, let's think about something you don't know how to solve. This is a numerical technique. So find this differential equation, move it backward through time. If you wanted to do the integral technique numerically, you can do that too. But what you'd have to do is a Monte Carlo simulation. Send the epsilons forward through time, take averages over many, many paths, and find it that way. That is a numerical technique for solving partial differential equations. These are two sides of the coin. At this point, it's a question of which numerical technique is better for the uh, project, for the uh, situation you have. I didn't mention a final way of going about the Black-Scholes formula which is by arbitrage arguments. The traditional derivation sets up a portfolio of stock and bond and then finds the portfolio weights to price the option by arbitrage. You get to the same answer, but I don't think it's a method that is uh, as, useful, as useful as these other two methods, or at least as congruent with the other things we've talked about on how to do things in this class.